Good evening. I'm Larry Eastland, chairman of the John A. Witso Foundation, and I'm delighted to be joined this evening in our Crowdcast series, Addressing Critical Global Issues, the Role of Faith Communities with Audrey Kitagawa, who is the chair of the Parliament of the World's Religions, and Baron Sani, who is the vice provost and the dean of religious life at the University of Southern California. Two very good friends. And this is such a wonderful opportunity to listen to two of the world's experts on global issues, the global issues from the perspective of what we as a faith community and how we're involved and what we can do to help deal with these global issues together as a faith community. So Audrey, I'd love to start uh, with asking you a question and then let's have a bit of a conversation about it. For the audience, you know that at the bottom of the screen um, is ask a question, and you're welcome to then type in a question, which we will get to about 20 minutes before the hour. On the side of your screen, you'll be able to see uh, your comments, your questions as you move al as we move along in this. So at this point, Audrey, tell us a little bit about you in particular and also about the Parliament of the world re World's Religions. I've been so fascinated by what you all are doing. Well, thank you so much. And I'd like to begin by expressing my deepest appreciation for this privilege to be with you, Larry and Varun, on today's conversation and with all of our guests. I am an alumni of USC, and I do remember my college days there with great fondness. And I'm very happy to have retained my connection to USC over the years and to help bring into fruition today's initiative between the Parliament of the World's Religions, USC, and the Witzel Foundation. And I also wish to acknowledge the wonderful reception which the Parliament received from the Church of the Jesus Day of Latter-day Saints during the Parliament's 2015 International Convening in Salt Lake City. It was an event that had some 10,000 participants from well over 50 spiritual traditions participating. And that convening focused on many important global issues, including peace, climate change, and women in leadership. And it was during that convening that the parliament launched the first women's assembly. You know, approximately 60% of our participants are women. And of course, women represent half of the world's population. So it is important to highlight the role which women play as powerful agents of transformation around the world. And in the inaugural convening of the parliament, which was held in Chicago in 1893, this really helped to launch the global interfaith movement, which is really thriving today. And the parliament is well positioned to address its significant global issues. And I would like to share uh, in due course about the important work of the parliament on these important global issues. So we do international convenings and it is a huge umbrella which all the world is invited to attend and the amount of goodwill and respect which is shown towards each other as we present our conversations our presentations our cultural events our songs our dances it is all the statement of how people of goodwill come together in this entirely respectful atmosphere to share, share themselves with each other. And in those moments, we have real life transforming experiences where people are uplifted to be in this community of those who are expressing their caring and their loving for each other. And that is a significant work of the parliament. Do you think, Audrey, that the role of faith in the, uh, in the issues of our time is growing? Are more people becoming concerned and is faith itself, uh, believers in a higher being, in a God, are taking a, a, a bigger role than in the past or, or not? Well, uh, of course, uh, you know, we have 84% of the world's population are believers. So necessarily, and the population today is unprecedented. This is the first time in history we have over 7.5 billion people 
with anticipated population growth in relatively short period of time, anticipated to be around 11 billion plus people. So necessarily the issues are becoming increasingly complex. And therefore, the role of faith communities is exceedingly important. Historically, it has always been important. But now more than ever, it presents important opportunities for people of faith to come together and to join hands to address these global issues. Because frankly, the global issues are so complex that there is no one person, institution, uh, government that can really address it alone. So in my New Year's message of 2020, I indicated that the work of the parliament would focus on this cooperative paradigm. So the uh, paradigm of cooperative engagement indicates the importance of coming together. While it is not about converting anyone from one religion to another, it is about being able to address global issues and to find mutual solutions, whether it is community-based or nationally-based or globally-based. And it is this aspect of engagement coming together, joining hands to create these important partnerships that together we can make a difference. I know that you're closely associated also with uh, the United Nations t and and that the, uh, that the church, our church, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is a member of the council that you're also on. Tell us a little bit about, uh, a little bit about that because many times when we think we meaning the layperson, when we think of the United Nations, we think of all the arguments and the big powers, uh, policy disagreements and so forth. But behind that, the foundation of that, our church and many others are a part of helping to find some solutions that we can work on together. So tell us a little bit about that. Well, really the prominence of faith-based organizations in the work of the United Nations became more focused with the creation in 2010 of the UN Interagency Task Force on Religion and Development. And it has 22 UN departments and agencies that have come together to address these issues and to bring in the religious communities. But in 2018- That's pretty new, they, isn't it? Yes, it is a re yeah. relatively new, and I will attribute, uh, you know, the coming together of this uh, UN Interagency Task Force to a very uh, brilliant, uh, wonderful lady by the name of Dr. Aza Karam, who is currently right. the Secretary General of Religions for Peace. And she was the chair of the UN Interagency Task Force and uh, was very instrumental in being able to have religion and development put front and center into the agenda of the UN Interagency Task Force. And in 2018, the UN Multifaith Advisory Council, which is comprised of 40 CEOs selected by the members of the UN Interagency Task Force and have come together around a commitment to uphold multilateralism and international human rights through multi-faith collaboration around Agenda 2030. And of course, Agenda 2030 is a commitment to eradicate poverty and achieve sustainable development by 2030 worldwide. Now really it's about ensuring that no one is left behind. So it was a landmark achievement uh, providing for a shared global vision towards sustainable development for all. And the role of the uh, Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints uh, is fulfilled on the uh, Multi-Faith Advisory Council by this wonderful representative, which you have by the name of Brian Cole. And uh, he also uh, was very kind to invite the members of the UN Multi-Faith Advisory Council to have a meeting in the beautiful headquarters here in Manhattan. So church, we church, work together. The church headquarters. Church headquarters. Yes, yes correct. And uh, you know, the role of the Multi-Faith Advisory Council is to provide advice and support to the UN Interagency Task Force. And I want to address these following thematic areas because they really do address and have identified the global issues. And it's the environment, migration and displacement, gender justice, financing for development, 
peacemaking and security and health, including a response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Sure. So the United Nations and the faith-based organizations have been instrumental in helping to address these critical global issues. Uh, Varun, join in. Hi, uh, hi, Audrey. Uh, Larry, thank you so much for hi. convening us. I'm so grateful to you for your leadership, Audrey. Thank you so much for being here, for your leadership of the yeah. parliament. It is the preeminent interfaith organization in the world today, and it's an inspiration for all of us. Um, Audrey, after World War I, uh, the world got together and st started to form the League of Nations. After World War II, it was the United Nations. And both of those uh, developments really emerged out of a shared sense of global suffering. And the aspiration of the League of Nations and the United Nations, as you know, was not just political, but almost spiritual too. It, justice, compassion, empathy, community, dignity, um, et cetera. We're coming out of a shared moment of global suffering right now, COVID. Uh, it, it, it's an experience that everyone is having at the same time, the likes of which we haven't seen since the world wars. Is this an opportunity for us now to reimagine um, the world anew in the way that we did after the world wars? And if so, um, what should the United Nations alongside its faith partners be thinking about, especially in terms of the uh, themes that you just mentioned uh, right now? Well, first of all, the founding documents of the United Nations, especially the preamble to the United Nations, is an extremely spiritual document. And it, it gave the inspiration, that impetus to call to all of the world's people, because the important words, we the peoples are articulated very clearly in that preamble. So it is addressing all of the peoples of the world in an inclusive multilateral process to address peace. Because as we all know, the United Nations was created after two horrific world wars. And it was a commitment to peace and to be able to have a consultative body where we all work together and address these global challenges and to do it in a peaceful way, to have dialogue and to follow these processes where we work together. And this is also a very important paradigm for all institutions as well as communities and families to address how we come together around the dining table, around the security council table, around any table to have dialogue and to share openly, freely with each other and to work out how we're going to create solutions. And faith-based communities are now also uh, you know, establishing this aspect of being able to work together as I had indicated earlier on, on this important paradigm of cooperative engagement. So more and more we are uh, finding the necess necessity to drop our lens of insularity and accept that we have to have a dilation into the global lens of engagement because the world is a very big small place and we have to be able to moderate uh, any kinds of conflict in a way that is going to be open and is going to be inclusive and is also going to take into consideration the many different viewpoints. And of course, as I indicated, the complexities are quite huge, but the main thing is to remember the inspiration, that spark of in, uh, you know, inspiration that really lifts the hearts and the spirits to help people to be able to coalesce around that inspiration that helps us to remember that we are very spiritual people housed in physical bodies and our diversity is the beauty and the wisdom that has been given to all of us to be able to work together and to have not only that voice of advocacy, but to have that voice of inspiration that helps us to coalesce around our values and think, the understanding of the deeper meaning of what it means to be fully human. You know, it's interesting that, you, that, that we use those words, we the people. Sometimes we forget how, how recent that term, we the people is in, in the history of the world. And even the use of the term we, instead of I, me, mine, 
Uh, that's a fairly modern concept. And uh, obviously starting with the uh, declaration, but I think it's important that we, the people, uh, continue to be at the forefront of who, quote, we are speaking for when we say that, whether it's the United Nations or the parliament or any of our organizations, that indeed is the pe that it is the people. So Varun, just a, a minute on that. Uh, 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 give us just a, a quick view on, on how that impacts what it is that you're doing. Yeah, well, thank you for that. You know, I, I think that's right. I think the idea of we the people is the idea of tribe, it's community, it's a place where we belong, it's connection. It can happen in family, it can happen in clan, it can happen in group, it can happen in nation states. And where I see the intersection of the United Nation and the parliament is that the United Nation is trying to bring reconciliation um, uh, and align nation states around, states around shared goals and values and aspirations in the same way that the parliament is uh, with religious communities. And that requires a collective we um, and an affirmative we. But I wanna take this in a different direction here and I would love to hear what Audrey thinks. I think part of it is we the people, but, um, but what I've seen during COVID and what I've seen over the course of my lifetime is that every infectious disease that we've experienced over the course of my lifetime and the pandemics that we've experienced from um, HIV AIDS to SARS to Ebola to H1N1 to swine flu to COVID uh, are all the results of humans abusing animals. And I'm wondering if instead of we the people, we need a more expansive sort of version of that in this post COVID iteration where we do start thinking about animal declarations of rights, not just human declarations of rights. Because at the end of the day, when we look back on our own history 100 years ago, we're in shock at how we lived uh, under segregation and indentured labor. And then you go back further, You know, we, we can't believe we lived in a country where we enslaved people. I think when people look back upon us 100 years from now, they're gonna be shocked at sort of the way we treated animals. Uh, even when we knew what the connection was with the abuse of animals, infectious disease, and catastrophic climate change. So Audrey, I'm wondering if when we think about what we learn coming out of this, is this a moment for faith communities to lead for all sentient beings, not just for we the people? Yes, of course, it is for, for us to lead in that direction. And I wanted to uh, share with you this very important um, initiative called the uh, United Nations Environmental Programs Interfaith Rainforest Initiative. And it is, uh, you know, communities of faith coming together and being able to address this issue of the human to animal, uh, the animal to human pathogenic transfers, which have been well documented now. And it goes to the growing effect that we have seen of this abuse of our environment, the mismanagement of it, and the wild, uh, wildlife trade in animals in very unhygienic conditions and the growing uh, transfers of these viruses that have caused pandemics of which we are in the throes of one now. And so I want to be able to refer you to the incredible study guides that have been created by the um, Interfaith Rainforest Initiative. And uh, we, if you go to the parliament's website, you will be able to access these powerful documents that really set forth what religious communities can do to come together and really address this kind of uh, animal to people pathogenic transfers to really study the illegal uh, use of animals in trade um, and also to be able to change our consumption habits because uh, you know the footprint to be able to grow cattle etc to feed our uh, meat consumptive habits also has huge impact on the environment. So yes, we the peoples should also be we all sentient beings on earth. I would agree with you there because all of life is sacred, whether it's in the animal kingdom, in the human kingdom, in the mineral kingdom, you know, we are all part of one earth. So therefore, it's not just people and communities learning how to get together and to express um, you know, their collective will through these kinds of engagements, but to also be mindful of animals and how we treat them. 
because how we treat animals is also indicative of the state of our consciousness. And, you know, it's very important that we un understand uh, this whole aspect of nonviolence and that we you know, should, you know, not have violence towards animals or each other, violence of any kind. Audrey, you know, uh, in our Latter-day Saint uh, doctrine, uh, we learn that we are that we don't own anything, that everything belongs to God, and we are stewards. We're not just stewards of ourselves and our families. We're stewards of everything on this earth, yeah, humans, animals, plants, the earth itself. And so, therefore, that we have a responsibility to be good stewards over all of these resources. And I think that matches what it is that uh, both of you are saying in this. And that is, if we're to be wise stewards, then we need to change how we think about everything around us, not just the people around us. That's right, because all of life and the, you know, the confluence of the great evolutionary flow of life itself includes all of the kingdoms, right? From the animal, plant, uh, you know, mineral kingdoms, humans. And what that indicates is that it's a process, an open process, an infinite, never-ending process of deconstructing, you know, calcified thinking and to be able to have the flexibility to adapt to the ever-changing landscape. So Lord Buddha would say the external world is impermanent, nothing lasts. But in that impermanence, it is a call to us to practice one of the very important principles of survivability, and that is flexibility. The willingness to change, not only in our conduct, but also in the deconstruction of calcified thinking that has you know, caught us in ways of behaving that are not uh, recognizing this sacredness of all of life as the, uh, Varun was trying to address. And so, yes, we the peoples need to change. That's part of the deconstruction of calcified thinking to we all of sacred life together. See, Varun, so this is, this is an important shift that needs think, to be made. Yeah, I think it is. And I think, it's, I, think it, I think the role of faith in this is absolutely integral because it then tells us that we are responsible, but we're responsible, not just to ourselves, but to a higher power on this. Uh, Varun, um, you're of the Hindu faith, I know. Yeah. How, how does that uh, impact, how does your Hindu faith impact your thinking on this? And then I want to get into a couple of questions with you directly on this. Totally. Well, you know, as Hindus, we believe that um, our souls are inherently divine. That's why we say namaste to each other. Namaste means um, it's our traditional greeting, but it, it literally means the divinity within you uh, acknowledge, uh, sorry, the divinity within me acknowledges and salutes the divinity within you. So um, even in our, our greeting, you can see an encapsulation of a Hindu theology. And I also think in the COVID age, when no one's shaking hands, Namaste is going to make a comeback here. So <laughs> we'll see. But uh, essentially, we believe that our souls are divine and that they are reincarnated over lifetimes. And then at some point, they become one with God. And so the, the goal of Hindu life is for our personal souls, which are a reflection of the divine, to become one with God. And all sentient beings have divine souls, including animals. That's why in India, you will see the depiction of God as a monkey, as a cow, as a snake, as an elephant. Some people will say, why do you worship the cow? Why do you worship the elephant? It's not that we're worshiping the cow or the elephant, but that we are acknowledging the God within the cow, within the elephant. That um, that the monkey is not God, the elephant's not God, but there is God in the monkey, that there is God in the cow, that there is God in all sentient beings and that we can recognize that. And so many Hindus are vegetarian for that reason. Um, uh, but I think more than that, what's important for um, Hindus and Buddhists and Sikhs and Jains for the traditions that um, come out of India or the subcontinent um, is this idea of karma or causality. Karma is cause and effect, it's causation, it's Newtonian, it's action reaction. And every calamity that we're in right now, we're looking, talking about addressing critical global issues. Every critical global issue that we're in right now, whether it's climate change, the global pandemic, income inequality, structural racism, you know, et cetera, et cetera, you name it. Those are all the results of human actions. Uh, they are the results of causality, karma, cause and effect. 
And so we have control over addressing the critical issues of our day by re-examining our own behavior, the way we act and move in the world, our own consciousness. Um, and the impact of that, the causality of the cause and effect of changing our own behavior will be that we actually help shift some of the concerns. So as Hindus, we believe that we are in a web of cause and effect um, of causality, that no one can escape the consequences of their own actions, and that we have to be very mindful of our actions because they will have an effect. Um, but we also feel empowered that we can solve the grand challenges of the day because we see them as the result of human action and therefore the remedy could also be um, based in human action. Do, do you see the, uh... Uh, the uh, the new consciousness of many of these issues uh, that the fortunately that the media presents to us we see things today that uh, even if you read in a book doesn't have the same feeling as when you actually see it uh, neither of you are old enough to remember this but i do remember very well on television when television was fairly new of seeing bull connor in the south beating blacks with a Billy Club. That was my first time as a child, uh, not a young child, but a child of actually seeing with my eyes live something happening that in books did not have the same impact. And don't you see the media that we have today and including the individual media, not just a mass media, as being a real advantage to us seeing live and in time injustice, seeing live and in time destruction, seeing live and in time lives lives being harmed, human lives, uh, other lives, uh, to, to, to see, and, and I use this example because, because we all kind of feel it, to see an elephant being destroyed, all of a sudden you relate to a lot of things that you didn't relate to before because, because it catches you right in your heart. And I want to go into into individual uh, issues as well uh, during this pandemic time. But even before that, Varun, you've been a world spokesman on young people and on, on the issues of loneliness, isolation, uh, uh, loss of faith and so forth. And Audrey, please check into this as well. I'll step back a little bit, but I'd like both of you to talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Thank you for that, Larry. You know, what I see uh, as Dean of Religious and Spiritual Life at USC, I'm essentially the chaplain for the university. So I oversee a hundred religious groups representing every faith tradition, over 50 chaplains representing many denominational perspectives. We even have a humanist chaplain for atheists and agnostic students. So we very much are an extraordinarily diverse faith community on campus. And what I have seen in my confidential pastoral conversations with students over the last uh, 12 years is when I first got there, uh, I was having really inspiring conversations, the hopes and dreams conversations. Students were really excited to go out and change the world. They wanted to go live their values. They wanted to be the change that in the world that they wanted to see. They wanted to live an extraordinary life. They were really excited to graduate and go out and sort of um, translate all the things that they believe um, into action for the world, into service for the world. These were millennials. Um, but about five or six years ago, everything started to change. Instead of talk, talking about hope, I began to talk about hopelessness. Instead of talking about meaning, it was meaninglessness. Instead of asking me, how should I live? Students started asking me, why should I live? And what I realized was that we are in a full-blown epidemic right now of loneliness uh, for young people. And it wasn't just me. People all over the country were seeing this in their clinical practices, in chaplaincy contexts. Um, uh, the uh, healthcare company Cigna just did a study that said the loneliest people in the United States are not the oldest people. They're the youngest people and specifically 18 to 22 year olds. They're post millennials who were born and raised in a digital environment. They're the world's first digital natives. And they are the first community to be communicating with each other and gathering in tribe in dramatically different ways. These are students who have been talking with their thumbs, but not with their tongues. They may have a thousand friends online, but they don't feel like they have friends in real life. And over the last 10 years on college campuses, we have seen uh, suicidal ideation, depression, anxiety double in the last 10 years. And we know that loneliness has a physical health consequence, that the impact of being extremely lonely is like smoking 15 cigarettes a day, that it can be a predictor for sort of a premature death. Um, and so we know that this um, epidemic um, is hitting people spiritually, emotionally, physically, uh, in all sorts of ways. 
Um, why this generation? What's going on here? Um, I think there's two predominant things that I have seen. One, of course, is social media. This is the first generation to communicate in entirely different ways. They've compared their real lives to the curated, idealized Instagram lives of others. So, of course, they feel like they're not doing well compared to what other people are doing, or they feel like they're imposters, or they feel like they don't belong because they feel like everyone else has figured it out but them. But the second part of it is this is a generation that's been raised uh, more than any American generation without religion. In 1950, 2% of Americans uh, were not affiliated with religion. Today, 20% of Americans are not affiliated with religion. But for my first year students, it's 45%. So 45% of my first year students are not affiliated with religion compared to 2% of their grandparents. That's a dramatic generational American story about religion. The most dramatic story right, that's happening right in front of our very eyes. And so when young people leave religion, um, sometimes they leave the protective factors of religion. They leave community. They leave an ethical framework. They leave an intergenerational transmission of wisdom. They leave the ritual or liturgy or stories or songs or scriptures that give them meaning-making opportunities. And absent those meaning-making opportunities, it's just about them. They, it's hard to understand your place in the universe, your connection to other people. In fact, COVID is maybe the first time many young people have really seen firsthand that they are part of a larger whole, that their actions impact other people, people they may not ever meet. Um, and so I do think that the, the loss of religion um, has led to a crisis of loneliness. Um, and that's not to say that students need religion or God, but they need something. They need a framework. And when you walk away from religion and it's not replaced with anything, it's not replaced with tribe, it's not replaced with a meaning-making opportunity, then it becomes hard to sort of understand uh, what your role is in the world. Not just what your job is in life, but what's your role in the world? Who are you? You know, What does your life mean? The big questions that make us human, the questions that connect us with everyone who's ever lived are not questions that students are being asked um, in their life. They're not asked in school. They're not asked in religious community. They're just not asked. They haven't wrestled with the existential questions that are fundamental to the human experience. And so I am concerned about young people. Now, over COVID, what's interesting is 46% of young people said they have turned to a new spiritual practice. So they are self-aware that they need some sort of support, uh, a moment of reflection, a way to process the pain of the world. Uh, our mindfulness classes last year had 400 people per session. This year they have 1,200 people per session and we have 500 on the waiting list. We can't keep up with the demand. Our study groups, our Bible study groups, our worship services are all doing really well online, even though people are Zoom fatigued. Why? Because I think for the first time, young people realize that they weren't actually leaving religion when they thought they were. They were just leaving the institutions uh, because they were distrustful of institutions, but they weren't leaving meaning and purpose. They weren't leading, le leaving ritual or connection or joy or gratitude or a sense of communion. They weren't even leaving God in most cases. 45% of our students are not affiliated with religion, but only 5% are atheists. So they're just trying to find their way in a non sort of institutionalized framework. And, um, and COVID in some ways may give them the opportunity to do that um, in a way that they haven't had before. You know, well, I wanted to address- I'd say, how, do we, how do we digest all of that? That is so much and so important. Audrey, please speak to that. Yes, you know, I think the loss of the uh, family structure as well, you know, having this intergenerational uh, living together. And I think maybe with like, for example, in my situation with the passing of my mother, you know, it may have been the last generation where there was a commitment to care for her in her own home and that she would pass in her own home and to, you know, see to it that she had, she was fully cared for, uh, you know, in the family setting. And so today we have the nuclear family and communities are, you know, where you had uh, communities living together. Like, for example, I grew up in a Japanese ghetto, but we had our churches, our temples, our shrines, and a, a commonality of our culture, our food, our language, etc. And then people started to move and disperse into the suburbs. And so this kind of relationship, community, started to disperse. And as, as a consequence, attendance at the church that was an incredibly popular as a center of community activity and bringing community together started to just dwindle. And now there are 10 members in my mother's uh, church. So all around, I do feel that churches are seeing this loss of the young people 
and being able to establish a relevance. And what it is, is that sense of family, the sense of community, because everybody is really living in their own isolated, you know, pods. And whether that is a construction of social media is one thing where we communicate by community digitally, but it's not the same as having a hug. It's not the same as no. coming home. No. you know, to to grandparents, parents, siblings, uh, you know, and friends in community. But uh, there's another thing that I also think is a great stressor that has brought about this phenomena that Varun was describing so, so beautifully. And I think it is the entire commodification of the value of the people to be consumers. And I think this is a direct outgrowth of our 50 years of economic policies that have made our values as consumers the value of your contribution to society. So that it's what you own, you know, the big car, the fancy car, the big house, uh, the newest, latest, greatest in technology that makes you stand in line for hours to get the newest iPhone, whatever. And so it is our identity as consumers that gives us our value and that is emptiness now i want us to remember you know that seminal work of victor franco in man's search for meaning right he said love Wonderful. is the only way to grasp another human being in the innermost core of his personality and you know essentially it is impossible to fully understand and appreciate another person without really loving that person you know you can be excited with you know seeing all the different things on instantly on social media but it is this aspect of being able to love another person somebody living alive in front of you that you can come home to and have rituals with, like cooking dinners, having conversation around the dinner table. You know, Frank Frankel said that when someone loves another person, he or she can see the potential of that person and the meaning the person ought to strive to find. And by loving someone, one has the opportunity to help that person find his or her purpose in life. So it is a purpose-driven life that we are able to have that spark, again, of inspiration because love is there. And there are many ways that we share and express our love. And, you know, I also wanted to bring in at this time uh, the importance of what I would, would say is the Parliament of the World's Religion's signature document, and that is the global ethic. And this is basically what the conversation that we are you know, having right now is. And I want to very quickly share the five important directives of the global ethic because it is basically values-based and addresses our common morality and the values that we are have been searching for. And there are, number one, a commitment to a culture of nonviolence and respect for life. Number two is the commitment to a culture of solidarity and a just economic order. So when you study the 50 years that we have had to see the kind of indicators by which we uh, measure well-being economically does not necessarily translate into well-being as human beings, well-being for the earth. And three, a commitment to a culture of tolerance and a life of truthfulness. Four is a commitment to a culture of equal rights and partnership between men and women. And five is a commitment to a culture of sustainability and care for the earth. These are all commitments and important principles of caring, mindfulness, compassion, you know, being able to take care of each other. These are the different manifestations of love being expressed and put into action. This is something that we do in our daily life, but it is very difficult to do when you misunderstand that your true value as a human being is as a consumer and what you consume and how, how, uh, you know, high in value materially uh, that is, and that gives you your purpose in life, your value in life, that is sheer emptiness because that is the material paradigm that is not you know, the expression of love. You know, <clears throat> several years ago, um, I wanted to write a book. Uh, Tom, Tom Brokaw wrote a book called The Greatest Generation. And I wanted to write a book called The Greatest Failure of the Greatest Generation. 
and that is the greatest generation came home from World War II and started to work and work hard and create a family. And they said, we sacrificed everything so that you, our children, don't have to sacrifice anything. And that created the 60s generation. We're going to give you everything. And what happens is everything is never enough because everything is never everything. And I think that's the start of what you're talking about there, Audrey. And that is the belief that we're owed everything rather than that we have an obligation to give back. Um, we have some really good questions here, by the way, that I would like, like to, to get addressed. Before I do that, uh, I want to make sure, Audrey, would you please, uh, you, you talk about your website. T tell the audience really quick, what is your website so that they can access your website? www.parliamentofreligions.org. Please visit it. It's a very dynamic uh, website, and it is chock full of very valuable, important information. Great. Okay, the first question is, as a Christian, I'm alarmed at the outsized presence of Christian nationalists who have fused nativist ideologies with Christianity. And the question is, how can we as Christians, and that's only part of the world of faith, but how can we as Christians overcome this sense of trying to fuse political ideology with Christian beliefs? Varun, take that first. Hmm. Well, that's a big one. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, one of the things that is so beautiful about American secular democracy is that um, people can be their authentic selves, even in their political lives. Um, the idea of American secularism as having this wall of separation between the church and state is not actually a constitutional idea. That was a, a part of a letter that Thomas Jefferson wrote a friend of his. The reality is uh, secularism is fluid. And so um, uh, we do have leaders who can lead according to their faith values in ways that um, are completely constitutional, in ways that, say, French secularism might not allow. But, um, but then you get into the problem, which we're talking about right now, which is this fusion of sort of religion and nationalism, which does in many ways um, undermine the secular character of our country. It directly violates the establishment clause, which is that no tradition should be established or endorsed over another tradition. What I think is essentially that um, there, you know, there is no Christianity. There are Christianities. There is no Judaism. There are Judaisms. If there was just a Christianity, uh, there wouldn't be 30,000 different denominations, right? And the fact that there's such a a beautiful diversity of Christian perspectives, beliefs, identities, worldviews, and experiences enriches the tradition. And so I think it's up to Christians to sort of lay claim to the soul of Christianity. And the most articulate, the most persuasive, the most important voices that are critiquing um, an insurgent Christian nationalism are other Christians, especially Christian leaders uh, who have different perspectives that they can offer. It's really important right now that we understand that our faith communities are not monolithic um, and that um, uh, that's partly why young people are leaving religion in such large numbers because they see institutions, especially religious institutions, as um, being part of the problem and not part of the solution. They see religious institutions as not living up to their own values. Uh, but when we have people who are speaking on from a faith perspective, um, articulating and living their values in a way that also resonates with young people, uh, then we are not gonna see this um, huge migration away from the institutions of religion. So I think it, the important thing is for people to stand up for what they believe in, to understand that there is a lot of different perspectives. The marketplace of ideas doesn't always re reflect the multiplicity of perspectives. And sometimes what I find, especially now that we're all, all online, the loudest voices and sometimes the most outlier voices have the the sort of get the most attention. But that doesn't mean that's where the critical mass of people or um, thought reside. That's just the loudest voice. And so sometimes we feel like we're singing to the choir. I think that's great. We need to sing to the choir. We need to expand the choir. It's okay to articulate our values to people who might already agree with us. That's fine. We need that sense of community and connection. And over time, that community gets bigger. Um, I had the privilege of serving as an assistant to the president for President Ford, and he used to say, the beauty of Joseph's coat was its many colors, and that's the beauty of America, this great fabric with all of its colors. And I've loved that, uh, I love that saying. 
one of the uh, other questions that uh, is asked is, how do, how do we re-engage young people in leadership roles in the faith community so that they so that they have it? If people have no part of the process, they have no stake in the outcome. How do we help them have a part of that process? You know, uh, uh, before I, I get to that, can I just uh, go back to the initial uh, previous question? Sure. And uh, because this whole aspect that, you know, I, I would like to address is that, you know, aspect of activism that young people are finding uh, to be the points of engagement. But, you know, there's a wonderful article by S.I. Strong, the author of Transforming Religious Liberties. And he what he does is discusses new ways of combating religious extremism. And he indicates that religious and political extremism present democratic societies with a quandary. How should a system built on tolerance deal with intolerant behaviors and beliefs? So he indicates that traditionally states have adopted one of two responses. One, ignore the activity in question, or two, seek to restrict or ban the problematic individuals, groups, and actions. However, he indicates that studies suggest that neither of these techniques has any real or lasting effects. And he posits that scholars have found that the best way to limit both the spread and impact of religious and political extremism is by engaging with the issues underlying extremist philosophies rather than shutting such views out of political discourse altogether. So again, this is the engagement process. So although this approach may not convince individuals at the far end of the spectrum to abandon their particular beliefs or behaviors, a policy of engagement can help to curb extremism by reducing the attractiveness of those types of messages, among which, you know, there are those in some ways who will be sympathetic to the extremist cause, and but it will also thereby decrease direct and indirect support for extremist behavior among the more moderate members of the community in question. So I would highly commend uh, this uh, book as well as article by S.I. Strong, Transforming Religious Liberties, as well as a new theory of religious right for national and international legal systems. So these are two very powerful um, articles as well as book that he has written. So <clears throat> on this issue, it is really an issue, the, going to now to your uh, previous question, it is really an aspect of the sense of belonging again that Varun had really addressed and, it, and the aspect of relevance that young people will find within uh, you know, traditional uh, institutions of religion. But more and more that we find that young people are willing to commit themselves, their resources, their time, their energy, and find their purpose in life through their activism and what is important to them to be able to spend their, their time on. And what is time? You know, time represents the units of your life. So whatever you give your time to, that's what you're dedicating your life to. So I think that for the um, traditional religions, finding that relevance of the addressing the activist nature of young people to find immediate entry points to be able to express what their purpose in life is, whether it's around you know, climate change, whether it's around uh, any of the issues that are important to them. Uh, this is, I think, our way of being able to honor and respect this aspect of the increasing uh, activism by young people. And uh, someone had coined the phrase sacred activism, and indeed, when you consider that their purpose is found in helping to make the world a better place through their actions to bring about transformation and create a tipping point for mass transformation by their collective activism, then we can honor certainly um, this bringing of the young people into the their entire relevance uh, in communities and to make this world a better place. And we really have to honor that. You know, I spent, uh, uh, I was seven years a, a Latter-day Saint Bishop in a young single adult ward. And what one of the things that I learned from that experience of hun literally hundreds of young people who came through the ward 
was we couldn't compete with the world on social activities. There are so many social activities out there. But where we could compete with the world was on service. When we engaged our young people in serving others, in working in the community and in communities where we had never worked before and worked, for example, in tutoring in the inner city particularly, tutoring actually became mentoring where these young people were working with high school students. And to see the impact on their life when some of these high school students who were getting Ds and Fs began to graduate from college, as, as they began to tutor them and bring them forward to getting A's and B's and getting into college. So I think what you're saying is not only accurate, it, I think it's essential that we find places where young people can lead in service service to one another, service to community, service on issues and so forth. And to do that in an interfaith way where we find, my goodness, I actually have an awful lot in common with you. We may be different in some things, but we both can serve together. Larry, in, in 2011, um, seems like a, a while ago, but it was the 10 year anniversary of 9-11. Of and at that time, President Obama said, instead of doing one day of community service, he, he, he wanted to challenge college students to do one year of community service and not just community service, but interfaith community service. So he challenged colleges to spend one year serving their local community in an interfaith way where people of different faiths came together around shared goals. I helped uh, work on this project with um, the Interfaith Youth Corps and the White House and um, it was a pretty high barrier to entry. You had to have a large document. You had to have a lot of stakeholders sign off of it, including the president of the institution. We were expecting 30 people to sign up for that uh, a challenge. It was called the, the White House Interfaith Campus, sorry, the White House Interfaith Community Service Campus Challenge. It's kind of a mouthful. <laughs> anyway, we were expecting 30 or 40 schools to sign that first year. We had over 200 sign up. And they weren't just universities or colleges. There were trade schools. There were police academies. There were Air Force academies. There were technical institutes. And so what I think happened was that President Obama, he didn't create an interfaith consciousness around service, but he revealed a pre-existing interfaith consciousness around service. He legitimized it. He gave it a platform, et cetera. Every year for the next five or six years, those numbers got bigger. 200 uh, uh, schools the first year, 300 schools the second year. Three, you know, It kept going up and we kept it going. It wasn't just a one-off, one-year thing. And so I do think you're right, Larry. I do think that many young people come to faith to be of service. That's where they find community, connection, and compassion. That's where they can be in the care of other people. That's where they're affirmed. That's where they see, feel seen and heard. There's so much noise and distraction out there that it's really hard for young people to feel like they're seen and they're heard. And this may sound a little controversial for me to say as the chaplain, but from what I have seen over the last 12 years, overseeing you know 100 religious groups made up of people from 140 different countries, a 70,000 person multi-faith community that is my congregation. What I have seen for young people is that more often than not, the theology, the theology is the price of admission, but the prize of admission is community, connection, and service. So Varun addresses really a very important aspect, and this is the fruits of the spirit, and uh, this aspect of service. So in Sanskrit, there's this very beautiful word called seva, and that does mean selfless service. So you commit your time, your resources, your energies uh, to being able to serve others. And it, you don't do it for self-aggrandizement or self-glorification, but it is really a selfless giving. And part of that selfless service is this aspect of sacrifice that you will you know, go beyond uh, you know, your own uh, pleasures, your own comfort zones to really go to the nth degree to really help someone. And of course, this aspect of service is not only within uh, the, the Hindu tradition, but in all traditions. So like from the book of Matthew, you know, Jesus said, I was hungry, you did not feed me. I was thirsty, you did not give me anything to drink. I was naked, you did not clothe me. I was in prison, you did not visit me. So he is addressing here this aspect of being able to serve your, your fellow man and to really be able to put yourself out there for someone. 
And I think this aspect of service is very, very important because each individual is a leader, leader of his own life, leader within the community. And, you know, the indices of moral leadership is very important because it goes to this aspect of providing value and meaning for people to live by and that inspiration to act and the motivation to hold oneself really accountable. And, you know, there was a, a beautiful um, photograph of this man carrying a another man on his back and underneath it were these words he ain't heavy you know so that was a beautiful graphic depiction of someone helping another and you know it is a stepping up to provide purpose and doing what is best for the greater good and this is really uh, the leadership of responsibility and a leadership of moral um, you know, having a moral core, that ethical core, and, you know, to do more than the minimum. So you push yourself beyond your comfort zone, and you really take your responsibility seriously. And part and parcel of that is a cultivation of that inner spiritual life. And so we are all guided by these spiritual truths, these teachings, these from the arising out of the sacred texts from these great masters, and, you know, from the Ten Commandments, uh, to be, you know, to that thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, thou shalt not kill. So it is also this aspect of telling the truth. And in it all speaks to one's ability to accept personal responsibility for one's conduct, whether in thought, word, or action. And this is sometimes the most difficult ground to cultivate, and that is the mastery of the self. But the mastery of the self is what's very important in all great traditions, uh, as well as teachers help us to understand that our ability to have that inner discipline, to be able to live life based on a moral foundation and to move in the world ethically is in and of itself your presence as an expression of love for others. You know, I, and this is not unique to Christianity, but it is something to remember uh, Jesus' statement, and that is that, that you love one another by this, by this shall you know that you're my disciples. In other words, all of everything else is secondary. It's out there. Uh, Aetna Life and Casualty did a, a study of parental discipline and over a 20-year period. And at the end of the 20 years, they wrote this long report on what they had learned from studying discipline, whether in families discipline was difficult or whether it was easy. And in the end, they said, what matters is that the children know their parents love them. And that was the big message that they got. Well, that expands, that expands beyond parents and children. That expands to communities. Uh, having worked in interfaith work now for well over a few decades, I can tell you that the friends that I have made based upon our shared common value of serving in the community are priceless, absolutely priceless. I think because you, you, you also, it builds trust that you know that you have you are with someone who is selfless who is loving is compassionate and uh is not just all me myself and i you know that they really yeah. uh, take into consideration the well-being of others and that goes all across the board not just fellow human beings but also the animal world, just as we began our conversation with today. Yes. So it is this mindfulness, this caring for all of sacred life. And that is really the essence of what the great masters and the you know mystics and seers, uh, the sacred texts all come to point the way to. And that is to have this uh, mindfulness, this um, development of the heart of compassion and kindness for each other. You know, Mother Teresa said, the only true religion is kindness. Varun, final comments. Oh, can't hear you. 
Sorry. Uh, you know, listen, it's a cliche to say we're living through historic, unprecedented times. Um, we hear that every day. But um, one of the things I think um, that I see a lot of people in my community struggling with, there are four or five things that I see a lot of people struggling with. One of them is the sense that we've lost our own narrative, that the world is being made for us and not by us, that the story that we're telling about ourselves is no longer a story that we're writing, that someone else is writing it. Our students feel like their careers have been disrupted, their lives have been sort of fundamentally disrupted, their education has in ways that feels disempowering. What I have found is that ultimately we're all storytellers and the stories that we tell about who we are is what we are at the end of the day. The, the thing that connects me at five and 10 and 15 and 20 and 30 and 40, and unfortunately I can keep going, isn't anything physical Not about as me. Far it isn't as even, I can go. <laughs> isn't even my hopes and dreams. You know, it isn't my molecular structure. It isn't even my memory. It isn't my values. What connects the dots across my lifespan is that I am always telling a story about who I am. And that story is who I end up becoming. And we need to lean into our stories right now. And our faith traditions have uh, histories and technologies of storytelling and mythology that allow us to write a narrative. And I hope that all of us can lean into our traditions for that creative act of storytelling right now so that we can write a story about ourselves and our world in a way that is meaningful to us and in a way that um, gets us to where we need to be. Audrey, last comment. Yes, uh, my last comment is a comment of gratitude, that this kind of discourse can take place, that the discourse helps to point us back to values, purpose, the meaning of life, the perennial question of who am I, as we try to moderate all of the increasing complexities in life. And the ultimate, you know, I had this wonderful opportunity and privilege to have a beautiful spiritual mother who said, our true purpose in life is God realization. That the, at the end of the day, you know, it's not your mind. She says, the mind is not real, only God is real. The body is not real, only God is real. Everything in the external world constantly changes and that is not real, only God is real. So it is this a process of neti, 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 not this, not this, not this. And then you come to this. And what is this is the perennial question that philosophers, saints and seekers, uh, seers have tried to help us through the eons to really come to grasp and understand that the essence of who we are as sacred beings. Thank you so much. It reminds me of when I left for college, I went in my grandfather's room who was 100 years old at the time. And he took my hand and he said, son, the good Lord in this country has been mighty good to you. Now you go out and be good to them. Well, the good Lord has been mighty good to all of us. And thank you so much, both good friends and wise and bright and brilliant and fun people to be around. Thank you so much. And thank you all for joining us. Thank you. I will say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you.